of the anemometer, which we'll call C, and you are able to count, which this is all done by a computer within the, the anemometer itself. If you count the number of rotations that occur within a minute, and then you multiply that by the circumference, you're able to get, if you measure it in inches, the inches that it goes every minute, you're able to then calculate that to be the miles per hour that the wind is blowing. Good question, Rachel. So, paano naman sa pangatlong instrument, yun ay yung tachometer. So, yung tachometer, ginagamit siya para mag-measure ng engine speed in revolutions per minute or RPM. So, ginagamit din to to determine yung rotational speed or kung gaano ba kabilis yung pag-ikot ng shaft or disc sa isang engine and it displays yung reading on a calibrated analog dial na nakadisplay sa dashboard ng sasakyan, aircraft, or iba pang vehicles. So yung display na yon, uh, it indicates yung safe RPM range which is meant para makatulong sa mga drivers para madetermine nila kung ano ba yung pinakamagandang gear and throttle settings and correct traveling speeds. So para po mas maintindihan, may provided po ulit na video. What is a tachometer? A tachometer, also known as a revolution counter, is a device that measures the revolution of a spinning object to calculate and monitor the rotation speed. In the industrial manufacturing industry, it is commonly used to measure and monitor the speed of a rotating motor shaft. This ability to monitor the speed will prevent damage to equipment as well as reduce loss of material. This is due to early detection of changes in the motor speed. How the tachometer calculates the speed of rotation or provides the reading will determine the type of tachometer it is. There are six different types of tachometers. Direct contact or non-contact, time-based or frequency-based, and analog or digital. Contact tachometers are fixed to the machine or electric motor and have direct contact. Non-contact tachometers commonly use a laser that is directed by the tachometer. Time measurement tachometers measure the time interval between incoming pulses, while frequency-based tachometers measure the frequency of the pulses. Analog tachometers provide an analog reading, and digital tachometers provide a digital reading. Tachometers can be used in a variety of machines in a variety of industries. Machines such as conveyors, windmills, grinders, cooling equipment, and elevators all use tachometers. Industries like power plants, chemical plants, automotive plants, material handling, food and beverage, and many more all take advantage of tachometers. Tachometers are a great device to measure the speed of rotation. If you like this information on tachometers, please like this video and be sure to subscribe to our channel for more information on industrial products and processes. For information about Radwell, visit us on the web at radwell.com or connect with us on social media. Thanks for watching. So, ang next natin na speed measuring instrument ay yung accelerometer. From the word itself, accelerometer, makikita na natin siya na siya ay device na nagme-measure ng acceleration na. For example, isang moving vehicles like cars. So, kesa mag kesa mag-base tayo sa definition, let's watch a video para mas maintindihan natin kung paano nga ba naga ng accelerometer. An accelerometer is an electromechanical device that can convert mechanical forces such as motion, vibration, and shock into an electrical signal that can be measured and recorded. In the industrial sector, where vibration levels must be monitored to ensure that machinery is operating at peak efficiency, piezoelectric accelerometers are the most widely used vibration sensors out there. There are many different form factors among piezoelectric accelerometers, but the one thing they all have in common is the piezoelectric element. Here's how it works. In this industrial vibration sensor, the piezoelectric element is attached to a weight called the sensor mass, forming what's called a spring mass system in the sensor. When vibration is applied to the system through the base, the mass produces an alternating force on the piezo element, 
which produces an electrical charge proportional to the vibration velocity and frequency. An integrated amplifier converts the charge into a usable voltage signal that can be read by a vibration meter. Because of their wide frequency response, good sensitivity, and easy installation, piezoelectric accelerometers can be found in many industrial and scientific applications, such as measuring low-frequency vibrations in robotics, in automotive applications detecting engine vibrations, in industrial and HVAC systems monitoring electric motor vibrations, detecting high-frequency vibration in gear noise analysis and turbine monitoring, high-impact shock testing, as well as measuring seismic vibration levels on roads and bridges to tidal forces and even earthquakes. Looking for accelerometers for your application? Call or chat online at omega.com. Thanks for watching and be sure to like and subscribe. So the next instrument is the radar. Radar uses radio waves to measure a moving object speed. This measuring instrument does not only measure speed or the velocity, but also the angle and the range. Radio waves are common in aircrafts and ships and for civil, Radar guns are mostly used. So the radar is mostly used sa mga barko or aircrafts, kagaya ng mga nakikita natin sa movie. Na for example, para ma-detect yung same ships or aircrafts within the area. So do remember na ang radar ay gumagamit ng radio waves. Para mas maintindihan, meron po po ulang video about radar. We all know radar is a way of detecting distant objects. We also know it uses energy to do this. But how exactly does it work? What kind of things can be done with radar to make it useful? With modern computers to process radar results, we can do a lot like look at weather patterns or find distant objects in the air or even in space. But before we go into that, I thought it'd be a good idea to get a basic understanding of how radar waves work first. So let's dive in. At its core, radar works on the principle that radio waves are reflected off of objects. Some materials are especially reflective to these radio waves, like most metals. But just about everything can reflect these waves to some degree. This means it's possible to illuminate a distant surface with radio waves and see it just like if you were shining a big searchlight on it. In fact, if you think of radar like a searchlight, it'll help in understanding its properties because radar waves share a lot in common with light. So far you've heard me use radar and radio waves interchangeably. That's because they're exactly the same. They're both electromagnetic waves. The only difference is how they're used. In fact, the waves generated by a microwave oven are also the same. This was something discovered by Percy Spencer in the 1940s, who noticed a chocolate bar in his pocket melted while he was working on a radar emitter for the military. He would later go on to patent the microwave oven. Those same electromagnetic waves can be used for different purposes. So let's take a look at how they're generated. Whether you're transmitting a radio broadcast or a radar signal, one of the easiest ways to do it is with a simple antenna like this monopole antenna. When you run an electrical current up this antenna, it'll radiate electromagnetic waves that follow the current upward. Then if you reverse the polarity, the same will happen in the opposite direction. If you keep doing this, then you'll generate a pattern with peaks and troughs. These waves appear with the frequency that matches how fast you're switching the polarity. We measure that frequency by counting how many times a wave passes a point in space per second. One wave per second is one hertz, and a million waves per second is one megahertz. The size of the antenna also affects how well it broadcasts or receives these waves. Most modern radar systems will use a component called a magnetron to generate these radar waves instead of a simple monopole antenna. The waves it creates are exactly the same, and just like a monopole, the size matters. The volume of these cavities determines the wavelength of the emitted waves. When we talk about radar reflections, what's actually happening is the radar imparts an electrical current on a surface it comes into contact with. Then as that charge moves along the surface, it generates a new wave, just like our transmitting antenna. We'll dive into this a little deeper in a future video. For now, we want to focus on the waves themselves. All radar waves have an electrical component and a magnetic component which is why they're also called electromagnetic waves. You'll always find these fields at 90 degrees to each other, and the direction the electrical field faces is called its polarization. In this case, it's vertically polarized since the electric field is oriented up and down. But if it were rotated 90 degrees, it would be horizontally polarized. 
Since all EM waves travel at the same speed, which is just below the speed of light within the Earth's atmosphere, then changing the frequency of these waves also affects how far apart each peak is. That distance is known as the wavelength. At 300 megahertz, the wavelength is one meter, and at 300 kilohertz, it's one kilometer. So we can see that as frequency goes up, wavelength goes down. It's important to know about frequency and wavelength because radar waves interact with the world differently depending on the length of the wave. EM frequencies are organized into groups called bands. There are different naming conventions out there for these bands, but two of the more popular ones are from the IEEE and NATO. This first scale was created in World War II to give names for radar frequencies. Later on, NATO would create this second scale, which makes it a little more intuitive to identify the frequency at a glance. Lower frequencies are less affected by weather than higher frequencies. Fog and rain absorb radar energy and weaken its power. That's because the wavelengths of higher frequencies are closer in size to raindrops and water particles, which means they interact with them more closely. Here we can see that these lower bands have much lower attenuation than the higher bands. Below about 3 gigahertz, there isn't much effect. So when these frequencies are transmitting in bad weather, they're more likely to get through. But even in clear weather, we see that the higher frequencies are heavily attenuated just by the atmosphere. So less of their power will make it through at longer distances. Once you get to the really high frequencies, their range can be as short as a few meters. Looking at this chart, you may be wondering then, why would we ever use higher frequencies? To answer that, we need to look at how our waves travel through the air. Here we can see another antenna. In this case, it's a dipole because it has two ends as opposed to a single one like the monopole we looked at earlier. As our antenna radiates, we see that the waves aren't two-dimensional. They're actually big three-dimensional waves, kind of like big bubbles. So when we increase frequency, the wavelength shrinks. And when we decrease frequency, that wavelength grows larger, which also makes the bubble larger. When we get a return echo from one of these big bubbles, we don't actually get much information besides the fact that there was something reflective somewhere inside that bubble. So if that wave was a mile wide, then that could be anywhere within a mile wide segment of the world. That might be enough to get a rough idea of where an aircraft is, but not enough to get good precision on it. Like if you needed to guide a missile towards it, or if you wanted to identify it by its shape. Higher frequencies produce smaller waves, which will give you that better resolution. It's just like how higher resolution on a monitor gives you smaller pixels on the screen. This resolution is called angular resolution. When we're talking about the equivalent of pixels in your radar, we mean how wide those pixels are in azimuth. This is important, because if multiple objects appear inside one of those resolution cells, like aircraft flying in close formation, then they'll appear as just a single return. But as we discussed earlier, this extra resolution comes at the cost of range. There's also another factor that affects the range of radar detection. As energy radiates away from the emitter, it spreads out over a wider area the further it gets from the emitter. It looks like this. Let's say we have a hypothetical radar with 9 watts of power, and each watt is represented by a red line. At a certain range, all 9 watts fit into this square of space. But when we go out to twice that range, those 9 watts are now spread across a volume that covers four of those same size squares. So each square gets only 2 or 3 watts of radar energy. Now if we go out even further to 3 times that range, now we see that a volume of 9 squares is still getting energy. But none of those squares is receiving more than 1 watt of energy. The same holds true for reflected energy. It'll get scattered and weaker on the way back. So if this radar station needed a minimum of 1 watt to see a target, then it would only be able to detect targets in this region between ranges 1 and 2. But this radar energy out here doesn't just vanish. It can still be received by other sources, even if the emitter can't do much with it. Let's take a look at an example. Here we have two fighter jets pointing their radars at each other. But this MiG-29 doesn't have a return yet on the F-16 because it's too far away to receive the minimum amount of power for detection. However, from the F-16's point of view, we can see that it is receiving a radar signal from the MiG-29. In this case, the F-16 pilot has received some useful information from the MiG-29's radar, even though the MiG-29 still hasn't gotten any meaningful returns. 
This dilution of power is known as an inverse square law, and it affects all radiated energy. Another factor that affects range is specific to low frequency radars. At these lower frequencies, radar waves are reflected by the layer of ionized air in the atmosphere known as the ionosphere. So they can travel over terrain that would otherwise block the signal and reflect back from objects at an even longer distance. They can also bounce up off the surface and may potentially interfere with return echoes. These extra returns are known as multipath echoes, and they can cause ghosts to appear in a pattern like this. So it's something that builders and operators of radar systems need to account for. These lower frequencies can also be diffracted around obstacles because of their long wavelength. This phenomenon is known as a ground wave, and it also allows these signals to travel farther. You'll find high-frequency radars in aircraft and missiles, not just because of the issue with low frequencies, but because of antenna size. Low-frequency radars have a high wavelength, so they need larger antennas that may not easily fit into the nose of a fighter or a missile. But they aren't problem-free. High-frequency radars are stopped by obstacles like man-made structures and terrain. This means that after a certain distance, the curvature of the Earth actually blocks the radar signal. Let's take a look at an example of this. If a radar system is at a height of 20 feet and is searching for an aircraft at an altitude of 5,000 feet, then it will have a line of sight on that aircraft at 80 nautical miles. Anything flying below this aircraft will be hidden away in this radar shadow. What if that same aircraft was flying at 250 feet? It wouldn't emerge from the radar shadow until 21.5 nautical miles. That's almost 60 miles closer. So you can see why low-level tactics are popular among military pilots that want to elude radar. Of course, increasing the height of the radar changes the equation. If we lift that radar up to 20,000 feet, it can now see that low-flying plane at 167 nautical miles. This is why AWACS aircraft are such a powerful asset. So far, we've talked about the properties of different radar frequencies. But we haven't gone over how those radar waves are turned into useful information for a radar operator. There are a few things we can do to make our radar emissions more useful. For example, with this emission pattern, we could get a reflection on an object here, which we could capture with the receiver antenna here. But this arrangement would give us a problem. All we would see on a receiver is a spike in energy, and that spike would look exactly the same if it came from an object that was here, or even here. So we need a way to shape our radar waves so we don't cover such a wide area. A common way of doing this is with a directional antenna, like a dish. This way we can steer our energy, and if we get a return, then we know the azimuth to that return. But this method isn't perfect. Because radar travels in waves, it doesn't stick to a neat straight line pattern. Some of that energy goes off to the side and even behind the emitter in a pattern that looks like this. This main cone is known as the main lobe. These smaller offshoots are side lobes, and anything behind the emitter is a back lobe. We have to be careful with these because they can give us returns we may not want. This radiation pattern also presents another challenge. As it scans its surroundings, it'll pick up aircraft within its main and side lobes, but there's going to be a gap in coverage above the radar site itself. Because this area is shaped like an inverted cone, it's known as the Cone of Silence. Any aircraft overflying the radar won't show up for the operator. So it's common to see radars deployed with overlapping coverage to take care of each other's blind spots. There's an additional problem with this setup. When we're continuously emitting waves like this, we only know the direction of a return. So we have to do something extra with our emissions if we want to get additional data, like the range and speed of a target. There are some techniques to help with this, like pulsing our emissions and measuring Doppler shift. We'll go over both of these topics as we continue this series. The ultimate goal here is to explain the fundamentals of EW and modern air combat. So later on, we'll go over different methods for countering detection like stealth and jamming. And we'll also talk about how IFF lets us identify aircraft. But first, we'll need to understand how radars work, which is why we're covering that in the first few videos. I hope you found this useful and thanks for watching.
So the next instrument po is LIDAR. LIDAR or Light Detection and Ranging operate, operates on the principal time of flight or time distance. Infrared light pulses are transmitted from the laser units at a moving object. Moreover, there is a possibility to ascertain an object's distance by the time it takes for a beam to bounce off an object and return since the speed of light is known. So unlike the radar, ang LIDAR naman ay gumagamit ng light waves. So kung ang radar ay gumagamit ng radio waves, ang LIDAR naman ay gumagamit ng light waves. So the radio waves cannot travel faster than the light waves. So mas mabilis ang LIDAR makadetect ng mga moving objects. And based on my research, mas accurate din ang LIDAR, especially sa pagdetect ng mga small objects sa in a bad weather conditions. So for further explanations, there is also a video about the LIDAR. LIDAR Light Detection and Ranging LIDAR is a remote sensing method that uses laser to measure elevation like ground, forest and buildings. LIDAR uses ultraviolet, visible or near-infrared source to sense objects. Light energy emitted by LIDAR system is known as pulse. Light reflected from ground or object is known as return. This means the LIDAR system sends a pulse of light and it waits for the pulse to return. It measures how long it takes for the emitted pulse to return back to the sensor. In the end, it gets a variable distance of the objects. Actually, this is how LIDAR got its name. Light detection and ranging. Like sonar uses sound waves to map things, radar uses radio waves, a LIDAR on the other hand uses light sent out from a laser. A LIDAR unit scans the ground from side to side as the plane flies. Because of this, it covers a larger area. While some pulses will be directly at nadir or a straight line, most pulses travel at an angle. Airplanes, unmanned aerial vehicles and helicopters are the most commonly used platforms for acquiring LIDAR data over broad areas. There are different ways to collect data using LIDAR from ground, from plane or from satellite. There are three types of LIDAR. Topographic LIDAR It maps the land typically using near-infrared light. Bathymetric LIDAR It uses water-penetrating green light to measure sea floor and riverbed elevations. Terrestrial LIDAR for mapping buildings, natural features and trees at ground level. It is also very useful for 3D models of heritage sites. How does a light detection and ranging system work? There are four parts of an airborne LIDAR. LIDAR sensors scan the ground from side to side with a pulsed laser beam as the plane flies. The sensor has a detector for sensing the returns from objects. GPS receivers track the altitude and location of the airplane. These variables are important in attaining accurate terrain elevation values. Inertial measurement units or IMU tracks the orientation and speed of the airplane as it flies. Elevation calculation use orientation to accurately determine the actual position of the pulse on the ground. Computers record all of the height information as the LIDAR scans the surface. These four parts of LIDAR system work together to produce highly accurate and usable results. LIDAR is used for wide area mapping, coastal changes, flood plane mapping and for engineering applications like for mapping bridges and roads. LIDAR system allows us to examine both natural and man-made environments with accuracy, precision and flexibility. In the next part of the LIDAR story, we talk about the various uses of LIDAR in detail. 
Keep watching. Okay, so uh, let's proceed to the next topic, which is flow. So what is flow? The term flow refers to the movement of a substance such as fluids, gases, or even specific types of granular materials through a system or physical space. The transfer of mass, energy, or momentum can all be part of this movement. Flow is an important topic in several engineering fields, including fluid mechanics, thermodynamics, and transportation engineering. So to add down, when we say granular materials, um, ito yung uh, multi-phase materials in which uh, mga substances siya uh, na made up of two or more phases. So to continue, the volume of fluid that passes in a unit of time is defined also as flow. Flow in water resources is frequently measured in cubic feet per second, cubic meters per second, gallons per minute, or other units. Flow measurement in water resources is critical for applications such as system control, invoicing, design, and many more. So, ang kinakonvey lang dito is that flow measurement in water is vital uh, para magkaroon ng efficient and responsible management sa isa sa mga critical natural resources natin, which is yung water. And isa pa dito, yung pag-insure ng sustainable water supply to protect the communities from flooding and also to help or assist industries to operate efficiently and responsibly. Next is that flow may be measured in a variety of ways. In diverse applications, each approach has distinct advantages, drawbacks, and accuracy. Understanding the features of the various flow measurement techniques is critical for selecting a suitable flow metering type for your application or correctly interpreting flow readings from an existing meter. So, syempre, alam naman natin lahat that accurate flow measurements are essential para makapaggawa tayo ng informed decisions in which makaka-affect siya sa environment, sa industries, or sa other in infrastructure, and also sa public welfare. So, for the equation for calculating the flow rate of a fluid via a pipe or channel is Q is equals to A times V, in which Q is flow rate, a is the cross-sectional area of flow, and V is the average velocity. And also, the flow of electric current across a circuit may be computed in electrical engineering using Ohm's law. Uh, I is the current, V is the voltage, and R is the resistance. So now, let's proceed to the different types of flow to be discussed by Tristan. Uh, hello po, magandang tanghali. I'm Tristan and I'm here to discuss the different types of flow. So, sana okay pa kayo. <laughs> so, meron po tayong six different types of flow, pero dalawa pa lang yun nandito. So, start tayo sa so steady and unsteady flow. So, dito sa so steady and unsteady, ang titignan lang natin is yung characteristics ng flow, such as density, viscosity, and pressure. So, sa so steady, pag yung characteristics niya is hindi nagbabago with respect to time at a certain point. So, yun nga, from the word is steady. So, yun, steady siya. So, on the other hand naman, pag unsteady yung characteristics niya and nagbabago siya with respect to time, it's considered as unsteady flow. Tapos, next is uniform flow. Dito naman sa uniform flow, ang tinitingnan dito is yung velocity ng flow. So, if yung... Fluid flow in which the velocity of the flow does not change with respect to time, so parang kagaya lang nung una, it is considered as uniform. So, yung non-uniform naman, of course, is kabaliktaran lang ng uniform. So, pag nagbabago siya with respect to time, yung velocity, it is considered as uniform flow. Next po. Then, dito po sa laminar flow and turbulent, ang pinakatitingnan lang natin is yung root ng, or yung, yung root or yung path ng fluid particles kung saan siya nag stream So, pag yung, ano, yung path ng mga fluid particles is straight at nakaparallel, it is considered as laminar flow po. Then, pag naman turbulent, siya ay nag-sumusunod sa zigzag pattern. 
Yun lang. Tapos sa uh, compressible and incompressible flows naman po, ang main focus nito is yung density lang. So when the density of the fluid changes from one point to another, the flow is said to be compressible. On the contrary naman, when the density of a fluid is constant from one point to another or hindi po siya lumilipat, it is considered as incompressible flow po. Next po. Rotational and irrotational flow. Dito naman po sa rotational and ir irrotational, ang titinitingnan lang natin is if yung fluid particles is nagro-rotate sa sarili nilang axis while they're moving down sa kanilang streamlines. So pag umiikot siya sa sarili niyang axis while nagmo-move, it is considered as rotational. Then on the other hand naman po, if hindi siya nagro-rotate sa sarili niyang axis, it is considered as irrotational. And last one is yung one and one, two and three dimensional flow. So sa una, the flow parameter such as velocity is expressed as a function of time and one space coordinate. So yun po, pag one space coordinate lang and ito yung na-express with the function of time, it is considered as one dimensional. So pag two dimensional naman po, and then, the velocity depends on both depends on both time and two rectangular spatial coordinates. Uh, so yan, it is known as two-dimensional flow. The third direct, direction's flow velocity is considered negligible na. Tapos yung last is the form of flow in which the velocity depends on both time and three mutually perpendicular rectangular space coordinates or yung x, y, and c na tinatawag. Yun po ang consider natin as three-dimensional flow. Then, yun po. Next reporter na. Magpresent po ako sa basic flow measuring instruments. Ang una po natin ay what is the what ano flow meters po. Ang flow meters po ang ginag ang flow meters po ang nagsusukat po mga flow ng tubig at mga bagay na tumutulo sa mga drainage system po or mga sa mga pump po. Maito po natin example ng flow meters sa labas po ng bahay natin. Kung saan may mga pagsukat ng tubig, nagme-measure ng gaano kadaming ginagamit ng tubig kada buwan or araw-araw po. Tapos ang flow meters po ay lagi nasa mga baba ng mga estado, mga cities po. Makita doon sa mga baba. Bwa, sinusukat nila mga galing sa mga buildings po. Sunod po ay dalawang broad types ng flow meters po. Ang madidiscuss po mamay po. Ang isa po ay Volter, Voltric Flow at saka mass flow meter po. Ang volt Ang two broad types po ay when measuring the voltric flow of the gas and when great accuracy is not required, voltmetric flow meters are advised. A volume flow meter, however, needs additional temperature and pressure adjustment when comparing findings. Thus, mass flow, flow meters, however, measures the flow rate without regard to the temperature or gas pressure. As a result, mass flow measurements are more dependable and provide better accuracy and re, repo, re, reproducibility. Tapos next po ay, mag-discuss po natin ang vol, volumetric flow meters po. Ang first example po ay ultra, ultrasonic flow meters. Ang ultrasonic po, flow meters po, ma, ayun po yung mga machines po na didikit, nakadikit po sa mga drainage system na nasa labas po. Parang masusukat po nila mga temperature tsaka anong manal anong manalaman ng fluids po nag nagdadalay po sa mak sa pagdaan po nila sa ultrasonic flow meters po tapos po may may video po naman po at tsaka ito po yung tour ng isang ultrasonic flow meters po tapos ito pang video po The most diverse substances are transported and distributed in piping systems every single day. They can include solvents and chemicals, vegetable oils in the food sector, coolants in primary industry, or petrochemical products. The fluids flowing through pipes often have completely different properties. Therefore, different principles are required for their measurement.
One principle is flow measurement based on the differential transit time method using ultrasound. The basic physics of this principle can be traced back to the English physicist and Nobel Prize winner Lord Raleigh. His book on the theory of sound published in 1877 describes the propagation of sound waves in solids and gases. Here is how this measurement method works. Inside the ultrasonic flow meter, pairs of sensors are fitted across from each other in the measuring tube. Each sensor can alternately transmit and receive an ultrasonic signal. Simultaneously, the transit times of these signals are measured. The ultrasonic signals are generated with piezoelectric crystals applying a voltage. Conversely, a piezoelectric crystal creates a voltage when an ultrasonic signal impacts the sensor. By increasing the number of sensor pairs, it's possible to accurately detect and mathematically compensate for flow profile distortions over the entire pipe cross-section. When there is no flow, the signal transit times are the same, upstream and downstream. Once the fluid starts to flow in the measuring tube, the ultrasonic signals are accelerated in the direction of the flow and decelerated against the flow. As a result, the ultrasonic signals now have different transit times, less time in the direction of flow and more time against the flow. Therefore, the differential transit time measured by the sensors is directly proportional to the flow velocity in the pipe. Together with the known tube cross-section, the actual flow volume can then be calculated. The greater the flow velocity, the greater the measured time difference between the two ultrasonic signals. For ultrasonic flow measurement, the sensors do not necessarily have to be fitted into the pipe wall. With a clamp-on system, for example, the sensors are fastened directly onto the outside of the pipe. They can be retrofitted at any time without interrupting the process. With clamp-on sensors, the ultrasonic signal is passed directly through the pipe wall and into the fluid. The signal continues through the fluid, is reflected on the opposite pipe wall, and then measured by the second sensor. In this example, with a two-traverse installation, the clamp-on design is unique because flow rates can be measured in very large pipes up to four meters in diameter. This possibility increases the areas of application, for example in the water and hydroelectric industries. The next pong example ng vo volumetric flow meters po ay turbine flow meters. Ito naman po ay parang same lang po sa, sa unang pong meter po, it's the ultrasonic meter. Ito naman nag iba po dito sa iba lang ang buwa. Ang iba lang po dito, may turbine po siya sa loob ng uh, drainage po. Kung saan, kada tuloy ng tubig, tas umayikot ang turbine, doon nagsusukat ang meter po. Ang example, ang itsura po, ganito po ang itsura, sa loob po doon. Ito po ang video po, kung ano itsura niyo po. In this video, we're going to discuss a very common flow measuring device called a turbine flow meter. Depending on who you talk to, a turbine meter has one or two major parts. Some will tell you that the turbine meter has only one part, the mechanical component. Others will refer to a turbine meter as having two parts, the mechanical component and the electrical component. In this video, we'll consider the turbine flow meter as a two-part device. All right, let's go. First of all, let's talk about how a turbine flow meter works. A turbine flow meter is inserted in a pipe directly in the flow path. The mechanical part of the turbine flow meter has a turbine rotor placed in the path of a flowing stream. The only moving part of the turbine meter is the mechanical rotor. The rotational speed of the rotor depends upon the flow velocity. The rotor blades are usually made of stainless steel. 
As the rotor spins, the passage of each rotor blade past a pickup point will generate an electrical pulse. The electrical pulses are created in different ways, depending upon the rotor blades themselves and the pickup unit characteristics. In most turbine flow meters, magnets are fitted to the blades, and a magnetic pickup sensor is used to create the pulses. The higher the rate of flow, the faster the rotor turns, and the greater the number of pulses. The shape and the voltage level of the generated pulses depend entirely upon the type of pickup unit used. The electrical pickup sensing device could be a simple two-wire passive magnetic pickup producing an AC type output. The electrical pickup sensing device could be a three-wire active device, such as a Hall effect sensor, that produces cleaner and more uniform square wave pulses. As we said earlier, the turbine rotor will turn at a different speed depending upon the fluid flow velocity. Fluid velocity is a measurement of the distance a particle of a substance traveled per unit of time. Typical velocity units are feet per second or meters per second. Fluid velocity plays a very important role in the operation of a turbine flow meter, but in most applications, a turbine flow meter is used to measure volumetric flow rate. Volumetric flow rate indicates the volume of fluid that passes a point in a unit period of time. If you could count the number of gallons of liquid flowing past a certain point in one minute, you would be able to state the volumetric flow rate. Volumetric flow rate is expressed in units such as gallons per minute, or GPM, cubic meters per second, and cubic feet per second. Okay, so now we've reviewed fluid velocity and volumetric flow rate. Let's talk about how a turbine flow meter is used to measure volumetric flow rate. When you buy a turbine flow meter, it should arrive with a tag or a calibration certificate declaring its K factor. This K factor is unique to each and every turbine flow meter and is determined by the manufacturer. As we discussed earlier, the turbine flow meter will generate pulses and the pulse rate depends upon the fluid velocity. The unique K factor declares the number of pulses that will be generated for every unit of product passing through it. K factor will be expressed in terms of the number of pulses produced, such as 150 pulses per gallon. Let's assume we are using a turbine flow meter to measure flow in gallons per minute, or GPM. This turbine flow meter has a K factor of 3 pulses per gallon. Recall that the unit for frequency measurement is Hertz. 1 hertz is equal to 1 cycle per second. With that in mind, we say that the turbine flow meter produces a frequency of pulses per second, which we express as hertz. If we have a K factor of 3 pulses per gallon, the output frequency at a volumetric flow rate of 200 gallons per minute, or GPM, is 10 hertz, or 10 pulses per second. If you're wondering where we derived these values, we've included a very handy k-factor calculator for you to use. You can find the link to this k-factor calculator file in the video description. We can connect the turbine flow meter to a PLC frequency input card. The input frequency now represents the volumetric flow rate. If we are troubleshooting or performing loop calibration, we can use a calibrator with a variable frequency output to simulate the turbine flow meter. Here's an example of a turbine volumetric flow rate measurement loop. A two-wire passive sensor pickup unit produces AC-like pulses, which are conditioned by an amplifier, before being sent to a high-speed counter PLC input module. Typical installation requires 10 pipe diameters upstream of straight pipe and 5 pipe diameters downstream. The turbine meter can only be used in clean, lubricating fluid because suspended particles can easily damage the device. The turbine rotor must be positioned in the exact center of the flow, and laminar flow is critical, often requiring straightening veins. Even though they are one of the most accurate volumetric flow meters in use today, they do have some downsides. The K-factor is not always consistent across the entire flow rate measurement range. Turbine flow meters are not accurate at very low flow rates. Viscosity is an issue as thicker or thinner fluids can change the rotor speed and affect the meter's calibration. Keep in mind that the turbine flow meter K factor was determined at the factory using a specific set of parameters. They are not recommended for steam. As with other mechanical devices, 
the rotor bearings wear out. In what industries are turbine flow meters used? Considering their popularity, a better question might be, in what industries are turbine flow meters not used? You will find turbine flow meters in oil and gas including fracking, water and wastewater, chemical, power, food and beverage, aerospace, pharmaceutical, and pulp and paper. If you want to learn more, you might want to review three of our other videos. How flow meters work, what is sensor calibration and why is it important, and what are two-wire and four-wire transmitter output loops. You can find the links to these videos in the description. Okay, let's review. A turbine flow meter is inserted in a pipe directly in the flow path and has a turbine rotor placed in the path of a flowing stream. The higher the rate of flow, the faster the rotor turns and the greater number of pulses generated by an electrical pickup. In most applications, a turbine flow meter is used to measure volumetric flow rate. Every turbine flow meter has a unique K factor stating the number of pulses that will be generated for every unit of product passing through it. There are several important issues to consider when installing a turbine flow meter. Considering their popularity, there are very few industries where turbine flow meters are not used. Want to learn PLC programming in an easy to understand format and take your career to the next level? Another, another example po ay vortex flow meters po. Ito naman po yung sinimeasure po mga pressured sa loob ng mga pressured fluids, fluids po sa loob ng derinch po. Ito po, ito po pinakamura daw po sa pagsukat ng flow meters. Tsaka po ito pinang ginagamit lagi po ang vortex. Tapos ito, itong vortex flow meters, ang mga fluids po nagko-form ng vortex form na parang vortex pagsukat po. Ang itsura po ng vortex flow meters po ay ito. Ito po ang video po. Flow measurements are essential to running a plant efficiently and safely. There is an array of flow technologies available to make these measurements, including the Vortex flow meter. Vortex meters offer many advantages for flow measurement, including easy installation without impulse lines, no moving parts to maintain or repair, less leak potential, and a wide flow turndown range. Vortex flow meters are comprised of a meter body, a sensor, and a transmitter, which together measure the volumetric flow rate. Within a vortex flow meter, an obstruction in the flow path, often referred to as a shedder bar, causes process fluid to separate and form areas of alternating differential pressure, known as vortices, around the backside of the shedder bar. These vortices then cause a small sensing element either behind or within the shedder bar to oscillate back and forth at a specific frequency. The velocity of the working fluid is directly proportional to the frequency of the vortices generated by the shedder bar's unique geometry. Using the known cross-sectional area of the pipe, volumetric flow can be calculated. This flow principle is referred to as the von Karman effect, a proportionality constant which relates the frequency of the alternating vortices to flow rate. The calibration constant is formed in a flow lab by measuring the amount of pulses that are generated per one unit of volumetric flow. This calibration constant is accurate over a wide operating range of Reynolds numbers. Because vortices must form in order for the vortex technology to pick up a signal, an adequate ratio of inertial forces to viscous forces must exist. If not, the meter will read no flow when the fluid is flowing. Once a mechanical signal has been formed by the vortices passing by the shedder bar, a sensing element takes the mechanical motion generated by the flexure and converts it into an electrical signal. This electrical signal is then passed from the sensing element through a circuit up to the electronics board stack, where it is then processed and turned into a quantifiable velocity reading. This signal is then outputted to the vortex's local display and out to the control system. Vortex flow meters are well suited for a wide range of applications and can accommodate liquids, gases, and steam while being able to withstand high process pressures and temperatures. Vortex flow meters are also a two-wire device, making them efficient with respect to power consumption. Vortex meters are available in a variety of meter body configurations and multivariable capabilities, allowing for compensated mass flow readings.
By measuring additional variables such as pressure or temperature, along with the volumetric flow reading, fluctuations in density can be accounted for to provide an accurate mass flow reading. Compensated vortex flow meters can prove to be especially useful in saturated and superheated steam applications, along with liquid applications in which a fluid is nearing its saturation point. Low flow cutoffs in minimal measurable flows can pose an issue to vortex technology. One solution to this limitation is utilizing a vortex flow meter known as a reducer. This configuration decreases the cross-sectional area of the meter body by one line size, yielding a higher velocity through the pipe. With a higher velocity passing by the shedder bar, lower flow rates can be accurately measured. Reducer vortex flow meters use the same face-to-face -face dimensions as standard flanged vortex meters, which decreases cost by eliminating the need for field-installed piping reductions. For chemical plants and refineries, Safety Instrumented Systems, or SIS applications, are critical to keep a plant running smoothly and safely. Dual and quad vortex flow meter configurations exist to accommodate these type of applications by providing redundant, independent sensors and electronics. This provides redundancy for uncommon modes of failures and helps to protect against spurious trips that these plants may experience. Emerson's Rosemount Vortex Flow Meters offer unmatched reliability using an all-welded, all-cast design with online removable sensors for enhanced safety and maximum process availability. Emerson also offers the widest selection of materials to provide a tailored solution for any process or utility challenge. Emerson Flow Measurement Technologies for all your application needs. Ang sunod naman po ay mass flow meters po. So, dito naman po tayo sa pangalawang branch ng flow meters. Uh, first example naman po ay ano, Coriolis flow meters. Uh, Coriolis flow meters uh, uses inertia to measure the mass flow of the gas or liquid na nagtatravel sa pipe or tube gamit ang twisting force on a vibrating tube caused by small actuators from a fluids Coriolis acceleration. Then, yung meter detects the angular momentum to find the mass flow. And they can measure the flow in both directions kung forward man o reverse direction. And next slide po, makikita natin yung uh, picture ng Coriolis flow meters. And next slide naman po para mas maintindihan natin yung The most diverse substances are transported and distributed in pipelines every single day. This may include drinking water, fruit juices, oil and gas, as well as chemicals, acids or alkalis. The fluids flowing through pipelines often display completely different properties. Consequently, there are different principles for their measurement. One such method is flow measurement based on the Coriolis principle. The French physicist Gaspar Gustave de Coriolis set out the physical basis for this measuring principle over 200 years ago. What is interesting is that the Coriolis principle allows the flow of mass to be directly measured. Let's take a closer look at how this measurement method works. A tube is located inside each Coriolis flow meter. An exciter causes this tube to oscillate constantly, here in an exaggerated example. If there is no flow, the measuring tube oscillates uniformly. Sensors are located at the inlet and outlet and register this basic oscillation precisely. As soon as the fluid starts to flow in the measuring tube, however, additional twisting is imposed on the oscillation as a result of the liquid's inertia. Now, due to the Coriolis effect, the inlet and outlet sections of the tube oscillate in different directions at the same time. 
The highly sensitive sensors pick up this change in the tube oscillation in terms of time and space. This is known as the phase shift and is a direct measure of how much liquid or gas is currently flowing through the pipe. The higher the flow velocity and thus the total flow, the greater the deflection of the oscillating measuring tube. The application of the Coriolis measuring principle doesn't stop here. It can also be used to simultaneously determine the density of the flowing fluid. To do so, the sensors also register the oscillating frequency. In other words, how often the measuring tube moves back and forth in one second. From the animation, it's clear that a tube filled with water oscillates more frequently than a tube filled with honey, for example, which has a far higher density. Thus, the oscillating frequency is a direct measure of the fluid's density. Both the density and the flow are determined simultaneously but independently via the tube oscillation. Endress and Hauser has continuously revolutionized and perfected Coriolis flow measuring technology in numerous innovative systems. This measuring technology is unique as it's the only way multiple process variables such as mass flow, volume flow, density, temperature, and even viscosity can be measured simultaneously in pipelines. For all The next one po ay um, thermal flow meters. Uh, from the word thermal, uh, it measures gas flow rate by the heat loss from a heated sensor in a pipe or duct. Uh, and the transmitter calculates fluid flow from the sensor's temperature and heat input naman po. So, next slide po ay yung image ng thermal flow meters and you know, maybe... The most diverse gases are transported and distributed in piping systems every single day. They can include air in the water and wastewater industry, carbon dioxide in food and beverages, nitrogen and oxygen in pharmaceuticals, or natural gas for boilers and burners. The gases flowing through pipes often have different properties caused by changing process conditions, Therefore, different operating principles are required for their measurement. One principle is flow measurement based on the thermal principle. The basic physics of this principle can be traced back to the Canadian physicist Louis Vesso King. In 1914, he mathematically described heat transport in flows. Here is how this measurement method works. Inside thermal flow meters are two temperature sensors protruding into the measuring tube. They're known as PT100 resistance thermometers. One of these temperature sensors measures the actual gas temperature as a reference, regardless of the flow velocity. The second temperature sensor is heated constantly via electrical energy so that a predefined temperature difference is maintained between the two sensors. For example, 10 degrees. If there is no flow, the differential temperature between the two sensors does not change. As soon as the fluid begins to flow in the measuring tube, heat is drawn from the heated temperature sensor via the gas flowing past. The heat then is carried off by the flow. The corresponding cooling effect is measured and compensated immediately by adding more heating current. As a result, the target temperature difference is continuously maintained. The heating current required to maintain the temperature difference is proportional to the cooling effect and therefore is a direct measure for the mass flow in the pipe. The greater the flow velocity, and therefore the additional cooling of the heater sensor, 
the greater the heating current required. An alternative adaption of the principle keeps the heater current at a constant value and then measures the change in temperature differential. But how is the heat actually transferred from the heated temperature sensor to the gas flowing past? This sequence shows that the heat is transferred by the gas molecules themselves. When the gas flows past, the molecules absorb tiny heat packets and carry them along with the flow. The faster the gas flows, the more often they absorb the heat. The heat transfer also depends on the density of the gas because at a higher pressure or lower temperature, there are more gas molecules in the pipeline. The greater number of molecules results in more contact with the heated sensor, meaning increased cooling and thus increased heating current flow. And finally, the heat transfer is also affected by the thermal properties of the gas. For example, at the same mass flow, the high thermal conductivity of hydrogen, shown here in green, causes cooling that is 100 times greater than with air. For a precise measurement, it's therefore important that the specific properties of the gas are known and are consistent. Flow measurement using the thermal principle is also possible in large pipes and ducts. There are meter types designed specially for this application. They can be inserted directly into the pipe via a standard process connection. It is important that the required insertion depth be respected so that the measurement is carried out at the correct point. For that reason, it's essential to program the actual internal pipe diameter for all insertion meters. Correct insertion also applies for rectangular and square ducting, often found in factory or building air circulation systems. With thermal mass flow meters from Endress and Hauser, many different gases and gas mixtures can be accurately measured, even at low process pressures and low flow velocities. For all applications, we have the right solution. Endress and Hauser, your single source supplier for measurement technology. Then next one naman po natin sa instruments ay ang rotimeter. Is, uh, it is a gauge that measures liquid or gas flow rate by the position of a float in a graduated last tube. And the gas must lift the float to flow through the tube. And they also provide constant flow rate and switching options for flow control. In this video, we are going to learn what is rotameter and how it works. Rotameter is a type of flowmeter that is used to measure the flow rate of fluids, typically gases or liquids. It consists of a tapered tube with a float inside that moves up and down as the fluid flows through the tube. The position of the float is proportional to the flow rate of the fluid, which can be read of a scale on the outside of the tube. Working of Rotameter When fluid flows through the rotameter, it enters the tapered tube at the bottom and the float rises upwards with the increasing flow rate. The float reaches a height where the buoyancy force equals the gravitational force and it remains in equilibrium. The height of the float is directly proportional to the flow rate of the fluid. The tapered tube is calibrated and the flow rate is measured by reading the height of the float against the calibrated scale. The scale is usually marked in units of volume per unit time, such as liters per minute or gallons per hour. Advantage of Rotameter Rotameters are simple, low-cost, and easy to install, and they require no external power source. They are relatively unaffected by changes in temperature, pressure, or viscosity. So next one po natin ay positive displacement flow meters. Uh, 
Siya naman po ay nag-measure ng flow rate by counting fixed volumes of fluid passing through gears or chambers. Uh, metering pumps also measure flow rate and add kinetic energy to the fluid. Many kinds of flow meters measure flow by physically separating the fluid into specific quantities that can be counted and passed on. This principle of operation is sometimes called positive displacement, and it involves measuring individual amounts of fluid so that a total flow value can be determined. Since these types of meters, in essence, measure fluid flow directly, we'll refer to them as direct flow meters. This oval gear meter is one example of a flow meter that uses positive displacement to measure total flow. As this simplified illustration shows, there are two oval gears inside of the meter. The flow of the fluid causes the gears to rotate. As they rotate, specific amounts of fluid are trapped in the chambers between the gears and the meter body. So each time the gears rotate, a precise amount of fluid is passed along. If the flow increases, the gears speed up, but they still pass the same precise amount of fluid along with each rotation. A counter mechanism counts each rotation of the gears to determine the total flow of fluid through the meter. Another example of a flow meter that measures flow directly is this nutating disc meter. It gets its name from the action of the disc, which can be seen here. The word nutate means to wobble or roll about an axis of rotation. During operation, the disc rotates much like a slowly spinning top. As the disc rotates, specific amounts of fluid are trapped above and then below the disc. An increase in flow will cause the disc to rotate faster, but the same amount of fluid will be passed along with each rotation. The nutating disc meter counts the precise amounts of fluid passing through it to determine total flow. And next naman po ay ang uh, open channel flow meters. Uh, it measures water flow and volume in an open channels using a non-contact level sensor and bonding equation. Again, Teledyne ISCO advances open channel flow measurement technology, this time with their laser flow non-contacting area velocity flow meter, which is available in portable and permanent configurations. Once the mounting hardware is in place, the deployment and subsequent activities can be performed from street level. This avoids the risk and expense of confined space entry. The meter uses an ultrasonic level sensor to measure the head height of the channel. From this level measurement, the meter determines a subsurface point from which it will measure velocity. The meter then focuses its laser beam at this point and analyzes the frequency of the reflected light. Any difference from the original frequency will reveal the direction of flow and its velocity. Like other area velocity flow meters, this meter calculates the flow rate from the user-specified channel dimensions, the measured head, and the velocity. In most cases, a single point subsurface velocity reading is sufficient to determine accurate flow rates. However, for difficult flow profiles, the meter is capable of measuring multiple subsurface points. These are truly unique capabilities in non-contacting flow meters. Collection systems are often subject to surcharge conditions. With the surcharge option, the laser flow continues to operate. When water reaches the laser flow, a bottom-mounted continuous wave Doppler sensor and pressure transducer take over the flow rate measurement. An air pocket protects the window while the laser and ultrasonic level sensor wait for normal channel conditions to resume. This technology is generally unaffected by debris and suitable for low velocity and shallow depths. Built-in diagnostic tools simplify installation and maintenance, and advanced communication options reduce your site visits. Ask your authorized representative how to get the laser flow from Teledyne ISCO.
So, good morning po. Good afternoon. So, ang sunod naman po ng instrument ay ang orifice plate. So, an orifice plate is a thin plate with a hole in a pipe. As a fluid passes through it, pressure builds up upstream but velocity increases and pressure decreases. The flow reaches its maximum convergence downstream where velocity and pressure reaches their minimum. The flow rate can be determined using Bernoulli's equation. So, yung Bernoulli's equation po ay it helps find pressure po in pipes according to diameter changes. So, ang orifice plate po ay sa pong device for measuring flow rate and also for reducing pressure or for restricting flow. Uh, ang orifice plates po ay madalas pong ginagamit where a pump delivers higher pressure than required by a system. Next slide, please. So, yan po ang tura po ng isa pong orifice plate. Here is how this measurement method works. Differential pressure flow meters have an artificial restriction integrated into the measuring tube, illustrated here by the example of an orifice plate. Two holes are located in the pipe wall, one before and one after the orifice plate. Two separate tubes connect these holes to a differential pressure sensor with its two pressure chambers separated by a diaphragm. The tiniest pressure differences in the flowing fluid can be precisely measured. If the fluid is not flowing, the pressure before and after the orifice plate is essentially identical. As soon as the fluid starts to flow, its velocity around the orifice plate increases significantly because of the restriction in the cross-section. At the same time, due to the laws of fluid mechanics, the static pressure at this point decreases. Consequently, different values are detected in the pressure chambers of the sensor, a higher pressure before and a lower pressure after the orifice plate. This pressure difference is a direct measure for the flow velocity and thus the mass and volume flow in the pipe. The higher the flow velocity and the resulting drop in pressure around the orifice plate, the greater the differential pressure measured. So, next five Venturi tube. Venturi tubes are tubular setups used to calculate fluid flow through pipes with inconsistent diameters. So, in short po, I, a Venturi tube or Venturi meter I, is a point instrument for measuring with accuracy the flow rate of fluids in pipes. So, when a fluid, when a Venturi flow meter is placed in a pipe carrying the fluid na susukatin po, uh, a pressure drop occurs between the entrance and throat of the Venturi meter. So this pressure drop is measured using a differential pressure sensor. And when calibrated, this pressure drop becomes a measure of flow rate. This is a Venturi tube. I've got a source of uh, air that will come in to this side of the tube. It'll pass through this region where the tube is wide and then here where the tube is quite narrow and then back to wide again. Since the same amount of air has to pass through this wide cross section as passes through here, the, namely the volumetric flow rate has to be the same. The number of cubic centimeters per second passing this spot has to be the same as the um, volumetric flow rate that passes this spot and because this spot, this spot has a smaller cross-sectional area the air has to flow faster here so we've got a high velocity region here a low velocity region here but Bernoulli's principle says that the higher the velocity the lower the pressure so in this spot here contrary to what your intuition might say Instead of the pressure being high here, the pressure is actually low. <clears throat> and we can demonstrate that using this colored water. I've filled the bottom of these, uh, this, this uh, U-shaped uh, glass tubing with water that has a little bit of food coloring added to it. 
What you'll see is uh, when we turn on the air, this uh, column of water in the middle will rise because the pressure here is lower and essentially acts as a suction for, um, for, for the water. So this one will rise higher than either the other, other two. So that's a Venturi tube, uh, a demonstration of the uh, Bernoulli's principle and um, very important in, in a lot of areas of fluid dynamics. So um, part of tube naman po, uh, it is a differential pressure flow meter used to measure fluid flow velocity, including airspeed, water speed, and industrial fluids. So, we measure po siya ng static and total impact pressure, with the latter being detected as the stream impacts the pipetopening. Pipe so, ang pipe tube po ay isang instrument for measuring a flowing fluid's velocity during speed. So, ang instrument po na to ay ginagamit po sa anemometers to calculate airspeed in wind tunnels and aircraft in flight. Nagmamessure din po sila ng flow of liquids. Next po. Do you know how to measure the velocity of this water? After watching this video, you will be able to and understand about P-TOT tube and the concept of stagnation pressure. Consider a piezometer tube. Piezometer tube is just used to calculate the static pressure. By measuring the height to which a column of the liquid rises against gravity. The fluid is static, relative to the moving fluid. Hence, it is normally termed the static pressure. The pressure height would be same, considering the flow is steady and incompressible. But what? If we replace it with a P-TOT tube? The column height of the water will increases. And this extra height is called the dynamic pressure, caused due to stagnation pressure. When the water particle enters the P-TOT tube, its velocity will convert to dynamic pressure. And stagnation pressure is the total sum of static and dynamic pressure. So the stagnation pressure represents the pressure at a point where the fluid is brought to a complete stop. Now let us apply the Bernoulli equation and derive the formula for stagnation pressure. For that, let us write point 1 and point 2. Velocity at point 1 is the velocity of flowing water V, whereas velocity of water at the head of P-TOT tube, that is point 2 is 0. The datum height Z1 and Z2 is 0. Now solving the equation with those value we get. Oh! Look! We get the pressure at point 2 that is stagnation pressure is sum of static and dynamic pressure. Now we can measure the velocity of moving water V, if we know the dynamic pressure. And it can be easily calculated by measuring pressure head. Static pressure is same for both points. Whereas stagnation pressure or the total pressure P2, at P top tube is same. Please subscribe for more fluid mechanics. So, last naman po na instrument is the target flow meter. Target flow meters insert a target into the flow field, measuring drag force and converting it to flow velocity. They capture the entire flow range, enabling accurate steam energy management and waste reduction opportunities. So, on um, target flow meters po, measure flow by measuring the amount of force exerted by the flowing fluid. 
on a target suspended in the flow stream. So the force exerted on the target by the flow is proportional to the pressure drop across the target. Next one. So, let's, so yun po ang report ko ng group 2 about the uh, flow and speed and flow po. Uh, Maraming salamat. Alright. So, thank you so much for the um, reporting and the presentation of um, group number 2. So, let me... Group number two, kindly open your cameras muna. No? So let me just check if uh, nabigyan ko kayo ng grades individual. Kindly open your cams, group number two. Okay na? So, um, Aledo, Ed, Bianzar. Where is Aledo? Naririnig po ba ako? Hello po, sir. Portanog, Rin. Good afternoon po, sir. Okay. Makulangan, Daniel. Present po, sir. Dongon, Aliana. Present po. Edi Glorio, Renzo. Ra Renzo. Edi Glorio, Renzo. Perez Tristan. Present po. Rivera Justin. Present po, sir. And San Sanchez Nino. Sir, present po. And Villanueva Romelia. Present po, sir. All right. All right. So thank you again, um, group number two, for the presentation and the reporting of um, our topic for today, um, which is... Um, which are um, about speed and flow. So um, everyone, let's give them or let's give group number two or, uh, a clap or a round of applause, please. All right. Okay. So, um, other group, aside sa group number two, do you have questions po ba or clarifications that you need to ask or do you, that, that you wanted to clarify this sa ating um, naging um, presentation? Any questions po para sa group number two? Everyone. Wala naman din sa four. Wala? Wala. Uh, how about the others? May questions pa? Wala naman Alright. So, um, sino may hawak ng soft copy ng uh, PowerPoint presentation? So, 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 sino man sa group 2, kindly post it na lang sa ating Google Classroom so that um, your classmates can have or can have a copy of it. No? Pakipost ako sa Google Classroom. And last um, reminder, no? so next week we will be having our presentation of your labor laboratory report. So, you'll be submitting um, you're gonna submit the, a hard copy of your laboratory reports, no, and as well as uh, please prepare for your uh, presentation. The um, duration of your presentation should be 15 to 25 minutes only. All right. So um, if you don't have any more questions, no, para sa akin or para sa group two, I think that's it for me today. Thank you all guys for attending this meeting, this session. Ingat po tayong lahat sa buong maghapon. Bye for now.